FTX appears to be a money burning machine, as bankruptcy has cost a lot of people a lot of money, and has gone down from a $32 billion valuation to basically worthless, with FTX entering into bankruptcy. Of course, a lot of big name VCs have now lost hundreds of millions of dollars on this whole situation. Sequoia, for example, has written down their $200 million stake to zero, according to a letter to their LPs. Similarly, SoftBank, reportedly losing $100 million. Now, SoftBank has not had the best bets in the past, but still, that's a lot of money, and they should have done some due diligence. But you've also got pension plans such as OTPP, which reportedly, again, has lost about $100 million. Then we've got other investors, like BlackRock or Tomasic. Tomasic being one of the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. They've lost massive amounts of money. The question is, why? What exactly went wrong? Why is it that they invested in a company that ended up having such appalling risk management practices? Or put differently, what red flags did they seemingly ignore? And of course, I'm an angel investor myself. I invest in early stage startups. And I do this with an organization called Sydney Angels. And if you're interested in finding out more about how to invest in startups, what type of analysis to do, and the due diligence that people often do, you can check out my course, which I will link to in the description below. And because it's FTX time, I'll give 50% off to the first few people that sign up using my link with the discount code FTX. But in any case, let's get on to what seemingly went wrong. We can start off by talking about the due diligence that these VCs did, or seemingly the lack thereof. Some VCs seem to have just looked at this thinking, well, Sequoia's in, so therefore I should be in. Which of course is terrible, because then you're just relying on Sequoia and what due diligence they've done. But if it's garbage in, then it's garbage out. And if Sequoia's due diligence was lacking, and always a little bit awful, then your due diligence by proxy is also going to be awful. And you just end up with this self-perpetuating bubble, where everyone wants to be in the company because someone else is in the company, and so on and so on and so on. Which perpetuates a vicious cycle, and then all of a sudden the company is worth $32 billion, when it perhaps shouldn't have been if maybe there were better analysis of the firm. Now, none of us were really in the room when they made this decision, of course. However, Sequoia put out a puff piece about their due diligence and about FTX. Now, this puff piece was probably written by a copy editor, but I very much hope they spoke to the partners who made the decision and potentially the investment committee behind the decision, if the investment committee screened this, of course, to determine whether or not it was accurate, because it doesn't look good. So if we have a look through their puff piece, we can see some big red flags. Now their puff piece specifically talks about the pitch meeting, where SBF pitches FTX to Sequoia's investors. And it says, the Zoom meeting went well for all concerned. SBF looked relaxed as he answered questions, talking as he usually does in complete paragraphs about topics of extreme complexity. Now, I'll stop here and say that a founder of an organization that's asking for hundreds of millions of dollars should be able to speak in complete sentences and complete paragraphs. I'm an angel investor, and pretty much every founder that has credibility can speak in paragraphs. That shouldn't be your decision rule. But in any case, it continues on. Aurora, FTX's head of product and another ex-Facebook engineer, remembers... We're getting all of these questions from Sequoia toward the end. He's absolutely fantastic. Aurora locks eyes with me, and I am mesmerized. Aurora is intense, calling to mind a Bollywood version of Adrian Brody. Unbelievably fantastic, he says, shaking his head, recalling this meeting in obviously vivid detail about how dramatically wonderful SBF was in this pitch meeting, convincing the partners to go on board. Bailey, another individual here, remembers it the same. We had a great meeting with Sam, but the last question, which I remember after it asking was, so everything you're building is great, but what is your long-term vision for FTX? That's when SBF told Sequoia about the so-called super app. I want FTX to be a place where you can do anything you want with your next dollar. You can buy Bitcoin. You can send money in whatever currency you want to a friend anywhere in the world. You can buy a banana. You can do anything you want with your money from FTX. Suddenly the chat window in Sequoia's side of the Zoom lights up with partners freaking out. I love this founder, typed one partner. I'm a 10 out of 10, pinged another. Yes, exclaimed a third. 
What Sukhoi was reacting to was the scale of SBF's vision. It wasn't a story about how we might use fintech in the future, or crypto, or a new kind of bank. It was a vision about the future of money itself, with a total addressable market of every person on the entire planet. I sit 10 feet from him, and I walked over thinking, oh poop, that was really good, remembers Aurora. And it turns out that this effort was playing League of Legends throughout the entire meeting. Not only that, Aurora says, but League of Legends is the kind of multiplayer online battle arena video game where every four minutes or so, a tactical maneuvering is punctured by 10 seconds of action known as a gank, gamer slang for gang killing. Will you and your team gang up on an enemy? There's a fight that happens basically, says Aurora, watching over SBF shoulder as he answered a final question from Sequoia. And I'm like, this guy is effing in a gank. Wow. The B round raised a billion dollars. Soon afterward came a meme round of 420.69 million from 69 investors. So here, all of a sudden, their own write-up, their own puff piece has painted their due diligence as a complete trash fire. It seems like partners were supposedly saying it's a 10 out of 10 on a Zoom meeting. Now, I've been on Zoom meetings watching a lot of pictures. I've literally never seen that. Now, maybe it's because the startups we've been pitched by aren't SBF with his fantastically curly hair and ability to play League of Legends while pitching, but many of the companies I've seen pitch are really great. They're great founders who are down to earth, who know what they're doing, have decent financials and have knowledge. They aren't the people who are ripping you off being charlatans. This looks terrible what, S uh, what Sequoia is presenting here. It looks like they were duped by a guy in a pitch meeting who presented a fantastical vision for the world of money. That makes the due diligence look amateurish, to be honest. Now, I sincerely hope Sequoia actually did some more work here, because if they're genuinely investing hundreds of millions of dollars into a company, then they should be going through and looking at the firm's financials. They should look at the team. They should look at the actual management team under the founder, particularly if we've got hundreds of millions of dollars being raised, and they should look at the product. They should get a familiarity with what exactly is going on with the exchange. Because if they don't know what's going on, if they don't know where the money is going, if they don't have the basic mechanics of what an exchange is doing down pat, then how on earth are you investing? So it seems like Sequoia might have missed the ball on several areas of due diligence here. The first one is the team. Basically, SBF is the founder, there are some other people hovering around, but SBF reportedly has hired Caroline Ellison as the CEO of Alameda Capital. She was 28 years old, and in this puff piece write-up, she's presented as appearing as a wood nymph in an investment meeting with SBF because she was coming from a LARP, so live-action role-playing. Now, I have no innate problem with people going to LARPs or anything, but when they're presenting her as that level of competence, as opposed to saying, this person is brilliant at being a quant and knows what they're talking about in financial markets and go out and make you a ton of money. They're presenting that side. It doesn't instill you with confidence. And indeed, a 28-year-old should generally not be running billions of dollars. That's not anything against 28-year-olds. It's against the fact they probably haven't seen many market cycles. A 28-year-old probably wouldn't have really lived through the global financial crisis to experience the dumpster fire that was going on then and therefore the amount of lived experience might not be quite as massive. Now, lived experience is not the be-all and end-all, but as Charlie Munger has noted by Paul Charlie's Almanac, one of my favourite books, link in the description below, he's noted that it helps you build up mental models. It helps you build up a framework to analyse future situations that might arise. Because sometimes you can learn from the past. Things don't necessarily appear to be exactly the same, but it helps you learn and that lack of experience is troubling. Also troubling is the lack of finance knowledge. Now, finance is a skill that you can pick up and it might not be rocket science, right? But if you're going to be managing a billion dollar fund, you at least need to know the basics of like options and option pricing if you're going to be doing quant stuff. Or you need to know some of the fundamentals of corporate governance if you're going to be going up bailing out an exchange. Because if you don't understand corporate governance and executive compensation, how are you going around doing turnaround acquisitions? Like if you're going to do distressed debt, you can't do that with just a math background. You need to have a familiarity with distressed debt as an asset class 
and also since they're effectively kind of taking over these exchanges with corporate governance and managerial compensation practices. The lack of experience appears to be troubling. And if he's putting someone with that lack of experience in charge of billions of dollars potentially, then it doesn't say very much about his management skill. Not only that, SBF himself didn't seem to have much of a background in founding successful companies. He's effectively a sole founder, admittedly with a team of course, but that itself is a little bit of a red flag. The next thing we have to consider is the money chasing deals problem. Now at the time of this investment, there was a lot of money going into Web 3.0. It was kind of seen as the future and people were just putting money into random crap. Like you remember the NFT bubble? Well, that's disintegrated because a lot of it was random crap. Similarly with some of the poop coins, a lot of those were attracting a lot of attention. Many people put money into them just because of the meme value or because it was entertaining or because Elon Musk sold some piece of rubbish and you can only pay for it with dope. So it's kind of like a joke, which is fine. Like things can exist as jokes and that's perfectly okay. But it doesn't mean that every single poop coin actually has value. Maybe we're piling into them. And VCs were piling into stuff that has blockchain or crypto or other names like that, seeing it as somehow the future. Now, granted, crypto might be great. However, one needs to value things appropriately. And when FTX is coming up against major incumbents, such as Coinbase or Binance, and seemingly SBF has gone around really annoying CZ, the CEO of Binance, kind of need to think, well, is this really a reasonable valuation? Now, at this particular point in time, it appears like there was a lot of demand for Web 3.0 stuff. So it appears there was more demand than there was supply. And this drove up the price to unrealistic levels, potentially giving both A, more exposure than there should have been, B, a higher valuation, and C, giving FTX more money than it really should have had before it had actually gone down and ensured it could do what it was doing properly. The next area of due diligence that seems to have failed is general risk management. Now, FTX is effectively an exchange. It's like a stock exchange. And stock exchanges are regulated, particularly in the United States, where there's heavy regulation about exactly what they can do with client money. And in particular, when you go out and buy a stock, you often actually have ownership of that stock. So even if the exchange goes under, it doesn't mean your stock disappears. By contrast, FTX was doing something different. FTX reportedly was enabling people to invest in perpetual futures, i.e. people put their money into FTX, they would think they might be buying Ethereum or Bitcoin or Doge or whatever it is. However, in reality, they were buying a financial contract, which effectively kind of gave them rights as a creditor, but it didn't actually mean that you owned the Bitcoin per se. Now you could potentially transfer out of FTX, but then you might be transferring or by transferring by getting them to convert the money into your Bitcoin, which you can then transfer out if you get the meaning. That meant that FTX was going around taking clients' money, then doing stuff with that. It appears they were going out and lending that to Alameda Capital, which would then give them, as collateral, things like the FTT token. Now that itself is a major problem, because it's like a bank lending against its own stock, which means that when that stock price goes down, your collateral value goes down, and it creates this vicious cycle. But in any case, it seems like we'd gone through to Alameda. That should never have happened. The VCs here, at least in my opinion, should have at least had some comfort level about what exactly FTX was doing as a risk management practice. That is, what was FTX doing with reserves? What was FTX going to do if there were a mass withdrawal? What was their tail risk? That is their value at risk or the conditional value at risk essentially from both A, if we're thinking about it from a broad intuitive perspective withdrawals, but also B, their exposure to Alameda. Because if you've got a massive tail risk, then you could end up being sunk. And if they're going to be actually holding themselves out to be a safe exchange, the risk management should have been like the normal stock exchanges. And at least from what we can observe, it wasn't. And that has manifested in FTX going bankrupt, at least in part, because they lent out money to Alameda, which then did stupid things with it, and then they had liquidity and solvency issues, meaning that both A, they couldn't get the money back to clients, and B, maybe they didn't actually even 
have that money because it was lost on stupid investments. The VCs who invested should have gained comfort about exactly what was going on with the risk management practices here. And at least from what we can tell, that might not have been the case. The next problem is corporate governance. Now, with corporate governance, that is vitally important. It sometimes is derided as being part of ESG, but corporate governance is all about shareholder wealth maximization. Basically, as a director, your duty is to go out and maximize value for your shareholders. Uh, and it appears that the corporate governance was lacking. It appears we have one CEO who had very little outside scrutiny or control. As far as we can tell, the VCs didn't really have board positions. It's not clear what oversight rights, if any, they actually had. It appears they were all falling over themselves to invest in a fund that they gave a 10 out of 10 to, and spending insufficient time thinking, well, we're giving this guy millions of dollars. Maybe we should be on the board. Maybe we should have some independent directors. Maybe we should have some oversight. Maybe we should actually think through what's going on with risk management practices. Maybe we need a risk manager that we have confidence with. Maybe we need to look at, as we'd have independent directors, what on earth is going on with the firm's cash? That's the type of thing you should be doing. Now granted, independent directors, or even shareholder directors, aren't infallible. They don't 100% prevent dumpster fires like this happening, but they absolutely reduce the risk. And it is all about risk management when you're investing in these firms. This is in addition to the sheer lack of skill some of these individuals seem to have had. It's in addition to the fact that SBF seems to have been making many, many millions of dollars, which he then funneled through into other random stuff, be it political activism or potentially putting it back into Sequoia, i.e. if he's getting money from Sequoia, he then cashes out some of that money and it's not totally clear how that worked. Did he sell his shares? Did he take some of the company money? Whatever. Then that goes back into Sequoia. That's weird, like really weird. And it's not entirely clear what was happening with that. And it appears like we ended up with an entrenched CEO who couldn't easily be removed with very, very little oversight, who appears to have had a God complex about his ability to go out and save the world as manifested by his political activism. If a founder is showing you so little respect, they're the playing League of Legends during a pitch meeting, then maybe they're a founder who really should never have gotten the money. Because if you can't concentrate for 20 minutes when raising millions of dollars, then really, you're not the type of person who should be raising money from an investor. If you have any thoughts about it, let me know that in the comments below. You can check out my course where I go through some of the investment related stuff, like some basic due diligence related things people look at, and some basic angel investing and investing in unlisted firms. If you're interested in investing yourself, you can also check out Sydney Angels. We do due diligence there, and we have due diligence teams that try to do a deep dive into organizations. It doesn't mean that no organization fails, but we try to mitigate the risks. And we'll be raising a third uh, fund, a third follow-on fund for us in the imminent future. We've already had two VC funds in the past, and we'll be raising a third VC fund coming up. But otherwise, thanks so much for tuning in, and hopefully I see you next time as well.